Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Well, tonight's subject is an interesting one. I didn't know what it was until about an hour ago, and I had an email from Christoph in Poland. He said, Amos, what's the subject tonight? I need to tell some people what the subject is. And I had to say, I didn't know myself either. I'd forgotten to ask Jacob. But the subject really is something which is really powerful. It's from Zephaniah chapter 1. I just want to read you the first three verses, and then we'll let Jacob take over. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Armia, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declared the Lord. I will remove human life and animal life. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will eliminate mankind from the face of the earth. There is the Lord. You don't hear that message preached very often in our churches, certainly <laughs> this last couple of years, but it kind of grips you. I'm hoping it's going to focus you on what the message is tonight when Jacob brings it to us in his fullness. So I just want to open up in prayer, and then we'll let's lead over to Jacob. Definitely. Lord, we just ask you to deliver this message via Jacob tonight, Lord, so that it impacts in our lives, not just for the sake of hearing it, Lord, but actually changing our mind, changing our focus, changing our resolve, making us more determined and realizing the fulfillment and the culmination of this world, which is probably moving a lot faster than many of us think. Lord, we can see the signs around us. What actually is going to happen on the day of the Lord? What's going to happen when you return? What is your son, Hamashiach ben David, going to do? Well, Lord, it's all summed up in this chapter. It's pretty concise. It's very powerful. But, Lord, we can't ignore it. And once we've heard this, we can never let it go. So it should quicken our hearts and our minds and our resolves, Lord, to witness, to reach out to those who don't know, who don't accept, who don't understand, to explain to them this won't be a day of celebration. This won't be a day where we can get off lightly. This is the Lord coming when he says vengeance is mine. Jacob, my brother, over to you. I'll mute all your microphones now. You will not be able to... You will be able to ask questions afterwards, and I'll unmute the microphones for that whenever Jacob delivers the message. Bless you all. Thank you, Jacob. Okay. Well, I only have time for a few questions tonight, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the holiday season. But secondly, this is only part one of what will be a two- or three-part teaching. So our next Bible study will be Zephaniah chapter 2, possibly 2 and 3, or possibly only chapter 2, and then chapter three. It has to be viewed in, in sequence. So it can't be done without looking at the whole teaching comprehensively from the entire book. Be that as it may, let's begin in the New Testament, first of all, before we go to Zephaniah. Turn to Second Peter chapter three, please. Verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God or the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, the elements will melt with intense heat. Literally in Greek, the stoichia will be dissolved with fire, which speaks of nuclear disintegration. But according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which the righteousness, in which righteousness dwells. You've got to get rid of the old to bring in the new. There comes a point where the old becomes so irreparable, so corrupt, so wicked, so unsalvageable, God can't do anything with it, but get rid of it and begin with something new. The day of the Lord will be that. Now, there is one book that deals centrally with the day of the Lord as its main theme. That is the book of Zephaniah, Zephaniah. But let's begin with his name, Tzephan Yahu, Tzephan Yahu in Hebrew, hidden in Yahweh, or <clears throat> hidden by Yahweh, hidden in Yahweh. 
hidden in a protective sense. More about that in part two, but that's what the name means. Hidden as a means of protection from the day of the Lord or the events that are preceding it and climaxing with it. Those who are hidden, the righteous who shall be hidden from what is impending. Tzafan Yahu. Tzafan Yahu. Now remember, the day of the Lord is virtually synonymous with the day of his wrath. The day of his wrath. The New Testament tells us we are not appointed unto wrath. We are not appointed unto wrath. Tribulation, yes. The wrath of God, no. When the rapture and resurrection take place, God turns his purposes centrally and focally back to Israel and the Jews and pours out his judgment on the kingdom of Antichrist. This is the wrath of God, Haron Yah in Hebrew. Haron Yah in Greek, it's a word orge, orge, not tribulation, but orge, wrath. This is the day of the Lord, the day of his wrath. Because the faithful believers are not appointed unto it, they will be hidden. They will be hidden with the idea of being taken in one place and then being removed. But it goes on, and it has a parallel meaning for Israel and for those who repent and believe the gospel at that time after the removal of the faithful church. So it's the idea of being hidden. We read the superscription that gives us the time frame, the opening verses, and we see he may have been related to King Hezekiah. Hezekiah. There's a debate among scholars as to whether or not we can be absolutely sure it was King Hezekiah, but most think it probably was. This indicates something. It tells us he was from a royal lineage, a royal family, a kingly family. Now remember, Ezekiel tells us the kings of Israel were to be the shepherds, the pastors of the nation. <clears throat> he comes from that royal lineage but there's something very wrong with it by his day. We're also told he's the son of Cushi, Ben Cushi. Cushi means Ethiopian, or it is also a Hebrew term for a black African. Some have suggested he was an African Jew or a Hamitic Jew. This may be the case. We cannot be positive. But we know he was the son of Cushi, son of Gedalia. Gedalia is quite a name in Hebrew, the greatness of Yahweh, son of Amaria, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Josiah was the last revival before the proverbial axe fell. Josiah was the last revival. I would point people to two parallel teachings or two companion teachings that Morio already has available on the internet. One is called The Hiding Places of God. The Hiding Places of God. And we looked at the places non-believers, as it were, sought to hide, as compared to the places that believers hid. And we looked at the destruction of those who tried to hide in uh, Masada, or in the Herodium. They tried, but it didn't work. The cave of Adulam was a place of temporary safety, as was Ein Gedi, where David hid from King Saul. In Scripture, we have the hiding places of God and the hiding places of man from the impending calamity. Non-believers will seek to protect and to hide themselves from the calamity when it comes, but it will be too late. 
What is the difference? Those who are in the hiding places of God will have been hidden by the Lord himself. They will be hidden by divine intervention, by divine providence, by divine action. The believers, that is, the faithful believers who are hid, will be hidden by the Lord. The others will try to hide themselves, but wind up not being hidden by the Lord, but hiding from the Lord. They will say, let the rocks fall on us and hide us from him. So we have those who will be hidden by the Lord, which relates to Zephaniah's name, and those who will wind up hiding from the Lord. And on the teaching, the hiding places of God, we draw the contrast between places like Masada and uh, Ein Gedi, and we look at Petra and places like this, and Pila, the other hiding places of God in scriptural history. The other teaching that goes hand in hand with what we're looking at tonight is the last revival, the last revival, a teaching that I first gave in 1985, I believe, in Israel, the last revival of the King Josiah, the last revival in Israel and in Judah, rather, before the Babylonian captivity, teaches about the last revival that will happen before Christ comes. Only it will not be the Babylonian captivity. It'll be, of course, Babylon the Great. Now, that is background. But let's go a bit further. Zephaniah prophesied around... 620, 625 B.C. He prophesied in the generation before the Babylonian captivity took place, the final fall of the temple and of Jerusalem in 585, 586 with Nebuchadnezzar. He prophesied in the generation leading up to these tumultuous events that would see the Babylonian captivity. His warnings probably played a role in spurning the last revival that took place under King Josiah. Now, that last revival, again, I'd point you to the recorded teaching. It is a teaching in itself. But let's look very briefly to 2 Kings. In chapter 22, Josiah comes to power. In chapter 23, verse 4, the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order and the doorkeepers to bring out from the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and Asherah and for all the house, all the host of heaven, and burn them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron. Remember, revivals always begin with people weeping, not people laughing, contrary to the lies that were told from those deceivers in Toronto, Canada, and places like this over the last generation. But secondly, revivals do not begin with building up. Revivals always begin with ripping down. Unless that which is not scriptural, and offensive to God is torn down, there will be no revival. If there's not a willingness to tear down, depose that which and those whom are not scriptural, revival is an impossibility. Revivals do not come from building up initially. They come from tearing down. You'll see people who think they're being spiritual, but they're only being ignorant and religious, and they'll say things like, we wanted something edifying, we want to build up in love, we don't want to hear this criticism of our brothers. These people 
speak in ignorance, and they're doing the bidding of the devil, but they're too ignorant and carnal to know it. They're doing the bidding of Satan. They're preventing revival, but they're just too ignorant and too carnal to know it. Now, I'm not just talking about the laity. I'm talking about pastors, even Christian leaders. Oh, we just want to build up in love. We don't want to criticize. If you're not going to judge on the basis of Scripture, you're never going to get back to Scripture. There'll be no revival. Zephaniah knew that. And it was impressed upon King Josiah and probably by other prophets other than Zephaniah, which I'll point out in a moment. But we see this, he begins the revival. But we are told that because of the sins of King Manasseh, Manasseh, because he killed the babies, because of what he did, sacrificing the babies in the Kidron, that the revival could only delay the inevitable. Many times we've highlighted this. God put up even with idolatry to a point, certainly all kinds of immorality, social injustice, etc. But when they killed the babies, remember the kind of storga love in Greek that a parent would have for their baby or a grandparent for a, god, a grandchild. The way you would die to save the life of your own child or grandchild. God created that love to teach about his love for his son who he gave in our place. It would be a very difficult thing to lay your own life down. But Jesus did that. This is storga love. Even unsaved people can relate to storga. They can't relate to agape in the positive sense of agape anyway, but they can relate to storga. When you take a baby and kill it sacrificially, and they were doing it to bring prosperity. It was an industry, a business. They went too far. The Western world has gone too far. The United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Europe, the Canada, they have gone too far. Revival can only delay the inevitable. It cannot prevent it any longer. The judgment of God is inevitable. Now you'll see people saying, but if my people who are called by my name, that first of all was about Israel, primarily and in context. But it ignores the co-texts that say there's a point of no return. And the Western world, like backslidden Judah under Manasseh, has crossed that point of no return. The judgment of God is now inevitable. It is shocking, and I have seen this in recent weeks. There were Christians saying, even though Mr. Biden is pro-abortion, he has Christian values, and he's a nicer person than Donald Trump. Now, I'm not trying to be political here, but anybody who thinks that there's any justification for any leader, any king, who favors the slaughter of babies, of the unborn, even partial birth abortion, even late-term abortion, even babies that can survive in incubators born prematurely, they want to kill them at the same fetal age they can survive, and they're doing it. When you have evil men in number 10 or Downing Street or in the White House who want this, Satan is in control of the government. Satan is in control of the Biden administration. If he becomes president, unless God blocks it, he will. Satan is in control. King Menasha is in control. Judgment has to come. Now, I accept that. What I find hard to accept is there are Christians compromising with it. First, they've compromised on things like homosexuality, then same-sex marriage. 
I mean, people who profess to be evangelicals. Well, abortion will be next. In fact, abortion is next. You're going to see it. You're going to see it. That's what it's coming to. That's what it became like in the last days of Judah. But now let's look further at Zephaniah. Thematically and in terms of his message, we could call Zephaniah the Amos of the South, the Amos of Judah. Amos was, together with Hosea, the main prophet for Israel before Israel went into the Assyrian captivity. The message of Zephaniah for Judah was very much the same as the message of Amos for Israel, the 10 northern tribes. Let's look, please, at the book of Amos, chapter 5, verse 18. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, what purpose will that be for you? It'll be darkness, not light. It is a bad time, a bad thing. Don't look for it in the sense of longing for it, but realize it's coming. Now, the things that preceded it, let's look at verse 8 of Amos chapter 5. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and changes the darkness into morning. Notice it points to Yahweh, God, as the creator of the celestial bodies, of the solar systems, of the galaxies. It points to him. Other civilizations do these things, from the Babylonians to the Greeks. They worship the gods of these galaxies and planets. But Amos is saying, what are you doing that for? The Torah says, don't do that. Yahweh, the God of Israel, made these things. These things are created. They're not creators. The growth of astrology alone is frightening when you understand what it meant for ancient Israel. Remember, Zechariah, I'm sorry, Isaiah warns about wizards and those who consult the stars. Well, again, I'm not just talking about horoscopes. We've had crazy evangelicals following people like Robert Breaker saying that the moon was in Virgo on September, on September 23rd, 2017. And Revelation 12 was fulfilled then. You're crazy people saying that. Crazy people saying things like that. The New Zealand representative of Bill Randalls was on board with that stuff. These things are insane. There were people who believed about 10 years ago, a trend, the gospel in the stars. They were looking to this stuff. Now, the scriptures do speak about stars and heavenly bodies as being typological of things, but not in any occult way. Yet you have people trying to mix the occult with Christianity. The other problem, of course, was idolatry. Zephaniah was the Amos of the South. But he was also, as it were, the first cousin of Isaiah and the second cousin of Micah. I don't mean biological cousin. I mean kindred spirit with a similar message. He was similar to Isaiah in what he was saying, and he was somewhat similar to Micah as well as to Amos. What is the difference? The central, recurrent, overriding theme of Zephaniah is the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. 
Now, when we interpret this in light of the New Testament, what it says in Peter, we're told something incredible, that it is a pesher interpretation. In other words, he was not primarily even prophesying for his own time. He was prophesying for his own time, for sure, that's the Peshit. But this term, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, he was prophesying for the end of the age. And therefore, what he was saying was, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that what transpired then in the generation before Babylon is what is going to transpire at the close of the age in the generation before Babylon the Great. If you want to know what's going to happen, look at what did happen. The book of Zephaniah keeps talking about the great day, the day of the Lord. It explains it more than any other book as a central theme. Now, the way it explains it is it uses the historical type of what happened in Jerusalem and Judah before the Babylonian captivity, as do other prophets. But it's the main message. It's the theme. It's the refrain of Zephaniah. And he says things that obviously were only partially fulfilled then. I'll remove man and beast. I'll remove birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked of the earth. Those things did not happen on a grand scale in the days of Zephaniah. What happened in the days of Zephaniah or the days that Zephaniah prophesied of, that is the days after Josiah, when the Babylonians would invade. Those are a microcosm of the macrocosm. They are a small model of what is going to come before Jesus returns. And so he says, I'll stretch out my hand against Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I'll cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests and those who bow down on the housetops to the hosts of heaven, the armies of heaven, and those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom. Now notice, they swear by the Lord, yet by Milcom. They bow down to the hosts of heaven, the hosts of Tzavaot has to do with armies, the armies of heaven, angelic regiments. What are you seeing? They swear by the Lord, yet they're okay with Milcom. Again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, go to the website of Satan's agent and public relations representative, Rick Warren. And when you go to the website of Satan's PR man, Rick Warren, you'll see his global peace plan is first of all partnering, P, and an acronym, partnering with Hindus, Mormons, Muslims, Catholics, partnering with people who worship other gods, who both Moses and Paul affirm to be demons as you've heard me say, Shadim and Damanoi. And you've got mainstream evangelicism following this guy to a major degree. They're following a man who says to do this. We partner with people who worship other gods. Then they have interfaith meetings. He was deposed for sexual immorality. He should have been deposed for false doctrine long before that. I met him once briefly in Chicago, Bill Hybels. He had the 
mega church where people were going and having conferences to find out how the big church, he was the predecessor of Rick Warren and how to grow a mega church. He had a Muslim imam after the September 11th attacks in his church explaining Islam to supposedly save Christians. Find me a mosque that would allow an evangelist to preach the gospel. <laughs> this was Bill Hybels. Bill Hybels, at the pastor's leadership conference he had every year, following with the Lewinsky scandals, he had Bill Clinton as the keynote speaker. Now, Bill Clinton was a proven perjurer. He was disbarred for perjury. And he was a sexual pervert. Not just adulterous or whatever. He was a pervert. He did unnatural things with a young girl at the age of his daughter. Things that were not even sexually normal. He's a pervert and a perjurer. Why would you have a pervert and a perjurer who twice vetoed, twice vetoed congressional bans on partial birth abortion where you pull a baby through the birth canal with forceps, do a suboxicital puncture, insert a suction catheter, and suck the baby's brains out while it's still alive? Why would you have a man like that teaching evangelical pastors? And why would 5,000 pastors, many of them, some I know from Calvary Chapel, going to it? And nobody said a word about the partial birth abortion. Now, of course, Hybels is gone now. He was deposed because they found out that he was also sexually immoral. It's no wonder he brought in sexually immoral speakers. He was sexually immoral himself. But you understand, this was the guy people were going to. They were going to Hybels and to was Willow Creek. They're going to, to Rick Warren. And it, it, this is the very kind of thing that was happening in the days of Zephaniah. The Levitical clergy and the government were taken over by these things. This is what was happening. And it's what's happening now. Now, when you say these things, you're either ignored or written off as crazy. But in the end, Zephaniah was proven right. The judgment will come. It begins with the ecumenical movement, but then it becomes interfaith. Oh, you call him Milcom, we call him Yahweh. He's the same God. <coughs> the Nabataean moon God, Allah, oh, that's the same as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what they teach at Hillsong. Well, let's look. When you do that, it says in verse 6, you've turned your back from following the Lord. Those who have not sought the Lord or inquired of him. If somebody was seeking Jesus, if they were really asking God for direction by his spirit from his word, they would know these things are wrong. But they've not really inquired of him. They've inquired of man, not of God. Verse 7, be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Then it will come about on that day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes, the king's sons, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. There are specific judgments for the Levitical clergy and specific judgments for those in political regal authority. The judgment of Christ 
will fall on these corrupt politicians who are dragging the Western world away from its Judeo-Christian heritage. The judgment of Christ will fall on them. The judgment of Christ will fall on these baby killers. Be silent before the Lord. And all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. The garments of salvation are the robe of righteousness, Isaiah tells us. They only come through the blood of Jesus, those who wash their robes. But there are those who seek salvation with other garments with foreign garments. Think of the vestments of the Roman Catholic priesthood, the amas, the alb, the cincture, the stole, the maniple, and the jazzable. Every one of those things was copied from pagan pontifical religion in the pantheon of Rome. Every one of them. In fact, in his treatise, uh, the development of the Christian religion Cardinal John Henry Newman, the most important Roman Catholic theologian in the history of the English-speaking world, admitted that 70% of the rites, rituals, customs, and traditions of Roman Catholicism are of pagan origin. He admitted it. He continues... I'll punish on that day all who leap on the temple threshold and fill the house of their Lord with violence and deceits. <laughs> Deceit? <coughs> the biggest connivers I've ever seen in my life are not unsaved people. They're word, faith, money preachers. Violence. They do this in the house of the Lord. It goes on. On that day, declares the Lord, there will be a sound of a cry from the fish gate. It's one of the gates of Jerusalem. A wail from the second quarter and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the people of Canaan will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. Now the Hebrew word for money and silver, kesef, is the same word. The backslidden church, like backslidden Israel and Judah, were financially motivated and driven. It'll come about at that time. I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. Moreover, their wealth will become plunder, and their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses, but not inhabit them, and plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. Well, let's look at this. Remember, the final church, Laodicea, is driven by materialism, but it's deceived by it. It mistakes its material affluence as the barometer of God's blessing and the seal of his approval. And this is actually taught and has been taught by Copeland, Hagen, these people, wanting to have their ears tickled. That's their message. It was not what Jesus warned Philadelphia about or what he warned Smyrna about. It's what he warned Laodicea about. And it says this, 
They're stagnant in spirit. They say in their hearts, God's not going to do anything about this. His judgment may tarry, but it's coming. And his blessing may tarry, but it's coming. Their wealth will become plunder. Those who seek security in material or financial fortresses to think that that is going to assure them anything when the day of the Lord comes, they're going to be disillusioned instantly. Instantly! Now it says, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. This is a reference to the paschal ritual called the Bedichat Chametz, where you remove everything containing leaven from the house. This is the Jewish families. And you leave a little bit of biscuit or bread somewhere and you play a game with your children when they're small and try to find it. And you go around with a wooden scoop and a feather and a candle and search for the leaven. The leaven is a figure of sin, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and a symbol of spiritual pride, it puffs up. The leaven has to be removed from the house to celebrate the Passover. As we purge the leaven before we take the Lord's Supper, we're told in Corinthians. The searching with lamps. Remember, thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. God is going to search his house with lamps. He will search to our feet, a light to our path. He will search with the lamp. People may ignore biblical standards. God will not. Near is the day of the Lord. It says it again, near and coming very quickly. Now understand what that means. It doesn't mean a week from Tuesday or next month. It means when it happens, it's going to happen fast. It means when it gets here, it's going to get here very quickly and take people by surprise if they're not ready and waiting. It's a mystery when it's going to be. We just see the signs it's getting closer. But when the time comes, it'll happen in the twinkling of an eye. It'll be too late, too late for the unbelievers and too late for the apostate church. Too late. Listen, the day of the Lord, in it the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, just like Amos. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of cloud and thick darkness, a day of trumpet warning and battle cry. And of course, it's at the last trumpet, the rapture will happen. So we continue reading. Against the fortified cities and the high corner towers, I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. They will walk around like the blind. Those who have the lamps will be able to see. The others will be blind. Now you can't see. How are you going to see when there's no oil in the lamp? How are you going to see 
when there's no batteries in the torch, the flashlight. It goes on. I'll bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them. On that day of the Lord's wrath and all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. For he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. Now notice that did not happen in 585 B.C. That did not happen with Nebuchadnezzar. That did not happen with the fall of Jerusalem. It only happened to Jerusalem and to Judah. It didn't happen globally. It was partially fulfilled in 585. It was partially refulfilled in the second falling of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But these were not global events. They are shadows of the global event at the close of the age. But what's it going to be like? What are people going to be like? What's the government going to be like? What's the church going to be like? Same as it was like in the days of Zephaniah. Yet, the book of Zephaniah morphs into a message of hope, of assured blessing for those who will be hidden. Not simply hidden in the Lord, but who will be hidden by the Lord. Now remember, what does Peter say once again, 2 Peter 3.10? We can hasten the day of the Lord. Hasten it! Why would you want to hasten something like that? Amos says, be not anxious for the day of the Lord. It will be something bad. What do you want to make it happen for? If you're hidden, it's to your benefit. When the judgment of God comes on Satan's kingdom and on this fallen world and its corrupt governments and its corrupt religious leadership and its morally bankrupt societies, <coughs> when it comes on the kingdom of Antichrist that's being built as we speak, It'll be to the advantage of the faithful people of God. It'll be to the advantage. Well, how do we hasten it? How do we do what Peter said? We do what Zephaniah did. We blow the trumpet. What Amos was told, set the trumpet to your mouth. We warn people. You see this COVID? The world's never going to be the same again. You see this September 11th? The world's not going to be the same again. And there's more to come. Much more. There's no security in the things you're hoping. You can't trust banks or governments. You can't trust gold and silver, precious metals. You can't trust these things. You want to be hidden from it? You can try to hide yourself from it, but whatever you hide, it won't work. You must be hidden. You must be hidden. Can't hide yourself. You must be hidden. And so we have the same message as Zephaniah. You notice that unsaved people are becoming very unsettled and disturbed. Businesses 
Businesses that had been there for 100 years have closed up. How will we ever get back to normal? How will people go to work? Can they all work from home? What's going to happen to the economy? Is it... No security in it. People know something is happening. We don't only know what is happening. We know why it's happening. And we know what is going to happen. Oh, yes, the Antichrist will come and bring a false security and a false peace and a false prosperity for a very brief moment. But that's all. It's time to hide, except that there's no place to hide. But while there's no place to hide, there is a place to be hidden, and that is in the Lord. Thank you so much for listening. We'll continue with Zephaniah chapter 2 and our next Bible study, not to be confused with the New Year's devotional tomorrow. Jacob, thank you so much. As much as that's frightening, it's incredibly informative, and it's a message I think that... If we get the chance to listen to the recording when I put it up on RTM tomorrow. Many of us will have to go back and make notes and really understand this and get it in perspective. Jacob, just one question that I would like to ask, and I'm sure there will be many from the viewers tonight. When we use the word day biblically, sometimes it refers to Yom, a biblical day. Other times it's a period of time. Yes. Recently, we've been talking about the Great Reset. The world is talking about the Great Reset. Effectively, this is the Lord's Great Reset. In Noah's day, it was the flood. But yes. here, the only allusion we have to how he's going to do it is in the last, or penultimate verse, by fire. Is that how you see it playing out, or is there more scriptural support as to how the Lord's going to achieve this? Okay. When you see the term, the day of the Lord, it is... Like, as you point out, Noah, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. It was a period of judgment. Yeah. But it says on that day when the Lord sent rain. So the day of the Lord is the same. It's a period. But it begins on one specific day. It begins on one specific day. It's a period, but it begins on one specific day. Like the stock market crash in 1929, the Great Depression went on for 10 years, but it began on one specific day. Okay. Okay. And how about the Lord's mechanism for doing this? Will it be by fire? Is there any other scriptures that support? Ultimately, in Peter, yeah, we have other teachings. The word there is stoichia. It actually does say before Einstein knew it was, or, or, proposed it was theoretically possible to dissolve an element, that's exactly what it says in Peter. Just you, will get, you, will get, you will get atomic dissolution. Yeah. Fantastic and frightening, but the Lord is faithful. We know what's going to happen. Well, who's got a question for Jacob tonight on, on this subject? It's got to be very specific. Um, I have some. Who's yeah. that? Is that Renita? It's Renita, yes. Hi, Renita. Um, <laughs> when you mentioned about garments, it reminded me of the Mormon garments. Did you want to comment on that? Very similar. Hasidic Jews, they put on um, <clears throat> something called tzitzit. Uh, Mormons, <laughs> <coughs> they put on this kind of underwear um, that they never take off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Must be pretty cruddy, but the, I asked the Mormon priest once, do you really have some underwear you never take off? And he just looked and said, I have a garment. And I said, it must be pretty cruddy. Well, yeah, the, these things are all, of course, counterfeits of the garments of salvation, all of them. You're correct. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks. I have a question there. Is that Eric? 
Yes. Hi, Eric. How are we doing today? We're good, brother. Uh, I have a quick question for Jacob uh, regarding the, the, the day of the Lord, the period of time. Yes. Where to start on a certain day. Does that day start when the rapture of the church happens? Yes. Okay. Okay. That ignites it. That ignites it. All right. And then from there after starts that, that period of time, the day of the Lord, where you have successive judgments. Correct. The, you read in the book of Revelation. It climax with the vile judgments in Revelation. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Good question. Rose, you have opened your microphone. Yes. Um, thank you for this wonderful teaching and opportunity because here in Melbourne, we're all in lockdown, very yeah, severe. So it's a real blessing. I belong uh, to the International Pentecostal Church with Aggie and Mila. Right. And, um, yeah, um, so it's a wonderful privilege to be able to get up in, early in the morning in Australia and hear this wonderful teaching. Thank you so much, Jacob. God bless you. God bless. My question is... My question is, in China, they're very severely persecuted, even perhaps threatened that their pensions, they won't get their yes. pension, the church is underground. Do you see that kind of really severe persecution coming to the West as well? Yeah, already um, in China still with had... social credit scoring? Yes, and, and like... You already see the rudiments of that with the, the social media rubber barons. Dorsey and, and Zuckerberg and these guys, they're censoring political opinion. They're mm -hmm. censoring people who would contest, the science, even the scientifically contest their determinations about COVID-19. You know, they, they're beginning to definitely profile people by opinion. Mm -hmm. And that will have economic ramifications, yes. And it'll be, it be, um, will be persecuted just even just in Melbourne market. right now. In Melbourne, they've been doing something in Melbourne or in Victoria, yeah, that has previously only been done in fascist countries, hmm. yes. And in my the other morning question, years, because, democracy is disappearing, yes, you're right. My other question is, you always say. Um, in your teachings that I've heard that the church will go back to being, as we've been in lockdown, the church will go back into being um, the same as in, in the Book of Acts, yes. meeting in homes. Given, like, even with our church, I live around the corner from our church, but there's a lot of um, other Christians that come from pretty far. It's going to be very difficult to meet in homes as we don't live, like, um, in countries where, you know, all the Christians are around, living around the church area, that's probably going to be very difficult for us to meet in homes. It's not only church. that, but they're going to use social distancing regulations to try yes. to infringe on home meetings. Ex that's what I thought because here in Melbourne, I live in 3055. My Christian friend who lives across the road lives in 3056. And we couldn't meet during lockdown because I That's couldn't right. cross the road. Understand. So it's going to be quite severe. So we're going to have to really stay really like in the word of God and getting yeah. and in with the grace of the, God. The prob problematically, eventually, they're going to try to stop Christian meetings by Zoom. Yeah, Zoom, but, yes. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you very much. We have RTN. Anyway, I have time for one more question, Amos. Yeah, that'll be Kayan, but just to mentioned to Rosie, I know of a Christian brother who spent a lot of time with a persecuted church in China, and he's since come back to the West, and he is bringing with him a training pack of the expertise and events that China has gone through for many years, bringing it to mm, the West can, to prepare pastors yeah. and teachers how to be covert, how to still maintain fellowship, how to actually communicate yes. in, an yes. in an oppressive society. And that thing was unheard of 10 years ago. Yet the Lord has appointed people like that who are tactically aware of the oppression and the mechanisms of the state so that we can still survive until the Lord returns. But those things are That's actively true. being done. Obviously, can't go into details, but those things are actively being done by the no. Lord. Kayan, you've got a question. Thank you. Um, yes, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, mine's a two-part question, but I'll try and keep it 
um, brief. So for the first part, I've just been thinking about, you know, apostasy and falling away. And one of the things I wanted to ask was, when it comes to eternity, should I, you know, enter heaven? And I asked God, out of all people, why didn't I, why didn't I fall away? Would, the, would, be a, would there be a reason? You know, why didn't I fall away? Why did he, this person fall away? So the Lord know. does not like to save people to lose them. Hmm. You understand? He doesn't... <laughs> He doesn't like to save people to lose them. Now, it's he who keeps us faithful. That's true. But we have a choice. We also have a choice. Nobody can snatch us out of the Father's hand, but the sheep can wonder and are prone to do so. It depends on you trust and pray as if it 100% depends on God, but you still live and act as if it 100% depends on you. The two are not mutually exclusive. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. I understand the, I, the issue of free will. I guess for me, when I look at it from like an eternal perspective, I just find it hard to understand why some freely choose to leave, I guess, and why I never... Well, if if people guess, fall away from the Lord, it's because they're trusting in this life and this world above the things of the millennium and of eternity. Backsliding always has to do with trusting in this life. Kayan, thank you for the question. Just going very quickly, put in a question from Gary, who's been waiting patiently. It is our last question of the night. Gary Willis, you've got the final question. Hi, Jacob. I have a question about the rapture. I started out pre-trib, then I was post-trib, and I'm I'm gotten to believe that the rapture is going to happen after the dead in Christ are raised first. And no, the rapture, the rapture and the resurrection are concurrent virtually. They're concurrent. Okay, that's what I was wondering. <clears throat> okay? They're concurrent. And it's not pre-trip. No, absolutely okay. not. I've okay. come a long way from then. You know, uh, the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, is not the best translation. But sometimes it's an interesting translation. <clears throat> and from Zephaniah 1, 15 and 16... In the Vulgate, it says the following. Uh, uh, it, this was put to requiem music, uh, funeral music, in the Roman Catholic funeral liturgy, the requiem mass, uh, uh, and it was used liturgically for, for funeral masses for dead people, unfortunately. But what it says in the Vulgate is the following. This is Zephaniah 1, 15, and 16. Diezire, diezira. Dies uh, tribulationis et angustiae dies calamitatis et miserae deus tenenberum et calignas di nebulae et turbines. A day of tribulation and anguish, of calamity. A day of, I'm just trying to remember my high school Latin here, my schoolboy Latin. Uh, and it will be a day of darkness and, and turbulence. Uh, and then it goes on, and it says, uh, Quandus tremor et futuris. Quandus tremor et futuris. When I look at the future, I tremble. Quandus tremor et futuris. When I look at the future, I rejoice. <laughs> Because and only because of Jesus and his grace. These things are not pleasant subjects. But the reality, remember, no expectant mother likes maternal labor and contractions. But they all love the baby when the baby comes. <laughs> That's the way it is. Easy for me to say I'm a guy, but that's the analogy the scripture uses. Well, thank you so much. When are we back, Amos? Tomorrow we're back, but the Bible study continues when? Uh, I have to look at my calendar while you're doing that, Jacob. But literally, tomorrow night, for those who joined late, we're having a special program tomorrow evening, celebration, really, and encouragement of things of the Lord, not to dwell on the dreadful year that we've had, but to simply look at the Lord's promise and his grace and his provision. We want to celebrate that tomorrow night from half past 10. 
If you haven't had the invite already from RTN, go to the RTN website. We start at half past 10. Simply click on the link there and we'll bring you through. We do encourage you to come along, even if it's only for 10, 15 minutes. If you can stay throughout, that's great. If you've got a favorite Bible scripture, a word of encouragement, or the Lord's led a prayer on your heart, then please bring it. But that's what's about it. It's fellowship as best as we can manage during these times with Zoom meetings, but also special teaching from Jacob, from John Anglis in England here, and from Charlie Douglas. I think Charlie might be still on the link tonight. I think Charlie's there. Charlie's up in Scotland, a great pastor, a great stalwart of the gospel. Are you still there, Charlie? I'm just looking through the link. There he is. Charlie, just un unmute your microphone for me a second, brother. Okay. Charlie, Charlie will be uh, bringing us into uh, the new year at half past 10 tomorrow night with, with a short message. But, Charlie, one of the things I just – I've never really met you before, but I've listened to you for many, many years. But one of the things that I think we need to be blessed by is yourself – you're not a youngster. You've come through a lot of medical dramas over this last few months, but you're still positive. You're still blessing people and you're still encouraging. And that's what we want to do tomorrow night, isn't it? We want us to make people remember that Jesus is about love and his grace overcomes all, really. Isn't that the truth? That's what we shall endeavor to do, yes. <laughs> so, Charlie... Charlie will be with us at uh, quarter to 11 tomorrow night, and he'll be doing the first lesson of the evening. Just wanted to introduce you to Charlie while you're here and have the opportunity, if you haven't met him before, just to say hello. Jacob, the first Wednesday will be Wednesday the 6th, the 6th of January for the next phase in our Zephaniah teaching. So that's Wednesday. Zephaniah the chapter 2, the 6th yeah. of, of January. 6th of January, 7 o'clock here in the UK. God bless. Bless you God. all. And lose tomorrow, Lord tomorrow. willing. Please do so. We we'll look forward. Take care. Thank, Thank you, Jacob. God bless. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bless you. Bye. Bless everyone. For more information about Moriel, check out our website www.moriel.org.